Hi everyone, Jonah Dempsey here in Santa Fe, New Mexico. I'm out by the Santa Fe River and today the subject is challenges of the perfect match. This is challenges of your ideal perfect match relationship, what challenges you might face. Uh, for those coming from a human design background, you will probably say there's no such thing as the perfect match. And that is true from the perspective of the human design body graph. The human design body graph does not show you who you're supposed to be with. It doesn't even really show you ideal matches. It, it can show you things about compatibility. It can show you some of the areas you might run into trouble. It can show you various things. Um, that is absolutely true when it comes to human design. Human design is wonderful for partnership analysis. I love it. It can help so much, but it cannot tell you essentially if you are the other person's perfect match. The system that actually shows perfect matches is the objective personality system. And this is something that thankfully we have a really wonderful example of this in the founders of the system themselves, Dave and Shannon Powers. And if you don't believe me, watch some videos of them. They are perfect matches. They're not perfect matches because of something in their human design body graph. It's they're perfect matches because they fully embody the ideal set of personality traits. They are essentially each other's perfect anima animus figure. This is very Jungian. They are perfect in the sense that Shan perfectly embodies Dave's anima. Dave perfectly embodies Shan's animus. And it's not easy to find this person. In fact, um, there are 11 sort of coins, as they're called in the objective personality system. And each one of these needs to be on the right side. So it's the equivalent of flipping a, a quarter, you know, 11 times and getting heads each time. That is the percent chance if you were to just kind of choose at random what the match would be. So. I don't want to move too fast here. Uh, I've done some other videos on this. Definitely check out the video where I talk about the perfect match and why they're the perfect match. I just want to give a little context. If you haven't seen that video, I want to get everybody up to speed. So first of all, there is such a thing as the perfect match. The perfect match is somebody who fully embodies your anima or animus characteristics. They also fully embody your shadow. This is what Jung meant when he said that you have to tease apart the shadow from the contrasexual impulse, that the, the shadow starts unified with the anima or animus. And this is one of the main challenges. So we'll get to the challenges in a moment, um, but I also want to just give them a little more context. So I've only had one relationship in my life with my perfect match. I've had some relationships that were pretty close, one or two or three coins off. But even those that are only a few coins off can have significant differences because depending what the coin is, you can end up in a different quadra. If this is all a foreign language to you, if you're not coming to this video from an objective personality background, don't worry about it. What I'm basically saying is that the perfect match is something very, very precise and I feel incredibly lucky to have gotten to experience that and also because I may never, probably won't ever meet someone again of that particular personality type and probably have no chance to be with my perfect match ever again for the rest of my life. I mean, never say never, but statistically speaking, probably not, that I do just feel lucky to have gotten to experience it and also to be in a particular space where I can now give cautionary stories for others to not mess it up because I messed it up and she also messed it up. We both messed it up and you know, we were each other's perfect match. I don't think life gives you many of those chances, right? And we had the chance to actually have an incredible relationship together. And we did at times, but ultimately neither of us had the growth mindset or the contribution mindset necessary to stick it out. And so those are two of the keys here. Uh, and for people coming from a human design background, you might say, Jonah, are you, are you literally saying the mindset is what's important? Yes, I am. The mindset is absolutely important. Having a growth mindset is kind of like having passenger consciousness. It's a surrender to the experience of life 
and a willingness to learn from the experience of life. So there, it's very much the same thing. So for anyone coming from human design who's sort of triggered at the idea that mindset or attitude or, you know, willingness to learn and so on might actually be important, it is important. Okay, so just, I do want to talk about some of the challenges. I just want to get, make sure everybody's on the same page here. So I was in a relationship with my perfect match. We met um, in 2020, I guess, right around the time of COVID, kind of one of those COVID relationships. Um, we broke up October of 2022. I actually checked earlier. It was 659 days ago. I haven't talked about it much because it's been very painful for me because we've only spent around 90 minutes talking since then. In fact, we were going to talk in a couple days and our last conversation really before the breakup was, you know, I just need a couple days to figure things out. Okay, great. Let's talk Sunday. Actually, it was Saturday. It's like, let's talk tomorrow. And it's like, okay, yeah, let's talk tomorrow. And then we never talked. And then it was really, really painful. And I tried to reach out to her, but I was blocked on all fronts, blocked on all avenues, and essentially completely iced out of her life. And then about six months later, we did meet to have a conversation, but it was a very short conversation, a very superficial conversation. And that was painful also because I thought we had built up enough to be able to actually process together or maybe communicate a little bit about what had happened. I was mistaken. And, you know, part of it is that uh, well, there's a huge betrayal as well. So she, she left me for a guy who was her friend. And she's a fourth line. For those coming from the human design background realize friends can be dangerous, particularly if they're a stranger. And so this guy was a complete stranger. She met as a stranger, didn't know any of her friends or anything. And he's a cross of rulership, 1-3, uh, Virgo. And you know what's funny is I was actually approached by a 1-3 cross of rulership, Virgo, same as this dude, same little slice of time. You know, and this person, very similar situation, offered me the potential possibility of a relationship. And after I broke up with my, I'll just call her Jenny, because that's her name. After I broke up with Jenny, um, you know, I actually did contact this woman and she said, okay, well, we can be in a relationship, but you have to never speak to Jenny again. You have to promise me that you'll never talk to her again, all this stuff. This is cross of rulership stuff. These cross of rulership people make the most insane rules. And so anyway, it was a huge betrayal because basically this guy was Jenny's friend. Uh, they started having an intimate relationship, so we talked about having something open. I was very uncomfortable with it, so it, it closed immediately. But then they kept secretly talking every day, day in, day out. And then eventually... A few months went by, and then she revealed to me they'd been talking, and it was a, you know, kind of a big blow. But I encouraged her to see where it goes, um, provided that we could remain friends. And we kind of promised each other we would always remain friends. And then, of course, the first thing he did, uh, I'm sure, was impose this rule on her that she couldn't have me in her life anymore. And it didn't help that she also had a uh, really vindictive, bitter pessimistic projector friend who actually told me personally like you guys are such a terrible match it's such a relief that you've broken up and I'm like <laughs> at the time I didn't realize we were the best match but I'm like I don't I don't think so I don't think we're a bad match it feels like we're a pretty good match now I know that we are actually the best match out of 2048 types and neither of us will likely ever have a chance to be with our best match ever again and you know I'm just coming to terms with that I mean, never say never, but it's almost like even if I were to meet somebody of that best match, I don't know, you know, it's kind of, and besides, you can't be hung up on that. I mean, I'm not like closed to dating somebody of a different type now because I've had the best match. Um, you know, you'll see when I go into some of the difficulties, it's very challenging being with your best match, but it's also tragic and tragedy is real. And I don't like the sort of toxic positivity that's like, oh, you guys weren't meant to be together. It's better that you're apart. It's like, no, like she was my Shan. I was her Dave. We had the same best match relationship as Shan and Dave. And we were, so you know, quote unquote, meant to be together. But things that are meant to happen don't always happen, right? And even if you're designed for each other, quote unquote, things get in the way. And in this case, this guy really got in the way. He had made all these promises he couldn't keep. He's a defined ego, and I trusted him. 
trusted her too, and he promised that he was completely supportive of us, promised he would never come between us ever. She promised me no matter what, we would always be friends. And then when it finally came down to the fact that they'd been talking every day for months, you know, and she'd been kind of keeping it secret from me, um, I just said, look, go for it. You need to figure out where this thing goes. I support you because that's what a good person does. And that is what a best match would say. Not like, shame on you, you did the wrong thing. It's like, no, I support you. We've made this promise, we've made this commitment to always be friends no matter what. And I'm here as your friend, you know. I care about you, I love you, and I want you to be happy. And besides, this guy had already promised that he was so supportive of us that I had expected that he would talk with her and kind of see what's going on and sort of realize that he'd interfered with a very good relationship. Well, that didn't happen. She said we'd talk in a couple days. A couple days turned into a couple weeks. A couple weeks turned into a couple months. Turned into six months. Finally, we had our first conversation. I mean, literally, preventing, literally, even just like a conversation that whole time. And then, you know, the conversation was very supportive, and I told her I support you, and I just want you to be happy, and I'm really glad we can talk again now, and I'm happy to have you back in my life. But then, of course, after that, um, she told me not to talk to her again, and then sent me an email a month later saying that she never wants to speak to me ever again, and just blocked me on every possible avenue, and we haven't communicated since then. And that's been, you know, almost 400 days now. So, very, very hurtful. Um... You know, as I mentioned, it's been like 660 days or something since she said she'd talk in a couple days. I have to just let go of that, but, you know, it's hard because um, it's not just like breaking up with someone. I mean, I've had other relationships. I've had very loving relationships. But it's a little bit more than that in the sense that your best match is not just somebody that you can have a relationship with and be in love with. It's somebody that actually embodies a whole lot of characteristics of you. So it challenges you to develop your own self-love. So so I guess one of the things I would say is, in human design, the undefined parts of your your, body graph, that's not you. We even call it the not-self. But in objective personality, the opposites of you are still you. They're still the parts of you that you've ignored and neglected. So they're basically your shadows. They're your shadow. They're your demons is actually the the term we call. And so your perfect match perfectly embodies all of your demons, perfectly embodies all of your shadow, perfectly embodies your anima, your animus. And because of that, it is so challenging. We can be so afraid of our demons. We can be so, I don't know how else to put it other than the lack of self-love of the self prevents the ability to truly love the other and that it's only through self-love that you gain the sort of right to be with your best match and you know i had a chance in this life and i messed it up and so did she and so did she right and it didn't help that we had people lying and betraying and you know she had this i mentioned this best friend who was a bitter projector saying you guys are a terrible match and you're better off apart. And she had this other guy claiming to be her friend who obviously wasn't her friend, he was a stranger. And if he was her friend, he would have really encouraged her to maintain a friendship with her friends, like me, but he didn't. Uh, And it was so, one of those twists of fate of where I had a woman who was a 1-3 cross of rulership, Virgo branch, just like this 1-3 cross of rulership dude, who both, you know, born the same birthday both ace of diamonds, total playboy, playgirl kind of archetypes. And that literally I started to kind of question, like maybe, hey, you know, she left me for this dude. Maybe I'm supposed to be with this this woman. You know, how funny would that be? Two, one, three cross of rulerships come into our life at the same time. And maybe we, we both go with them. But she told me I had to just never speak to Jenny again. And I didn't like that. And I said, no, I said, no, it's absolutely not possible. Jenny is my best friend. I would never do that to her. So anyway, kind of a long-winded way of just giving some context on the whole situation. It's been a couple years now, so I feel like I can talk about it more openly. But basically, you know, this guy promised he would never interrupt our relationship, promised he would be supportive of us no matter what, promised that he supported Jenny in all ways and wanted her to be happy, 
I was super encouraging of her, saying, I just want you to be happy, Jenny. Just do whatever it takes to just feel good, and I love you, and I just always want to be your friend, and we have this promise to each other to always be friends. And, you know, I'm pretty, still pretty angry about that betrayal because I was so supportive and so um, helpful and encouraging. You know, I did everything the perfect match would do. Like, that's the, the kind of funny joke here, right? Like, when you are with the perfect match, they are so perfect, they'll even support you in breaking up with them if you're not ready to remain in that commitment to actually doing the really difficult work of self-love. Uh, and it is hard. So, okay, so just a little background. You got the backstory. So what is the perfect match? Well, in objective personality, there are 13 coins, 11 if you don't count the social coins. We were actually a perfect match even in the social coins, which is kind of crazy. We were like the perfect 13 out of 13. Basically one in 2048 personality type perfect match. And so what that is, is somebody who's of the same quadra as you and the same information or energy dominance as you. So Jenny and I are both info dominant. We're both in the same quadra. For those who don't know personality theory, a quadra is sort of a set of preferences. Like we both prefer keeping our feelings to ourselves. We both prefer sharing our rationale for things. We both prefer, you know, gathering a lot of patterns. We both prefer narrowing down into sensory facts. A lot of little details there. But basically, we're part of the same quadra. And we're both information dominant, so we love sharing information. And we would actually talk for hours and hours and hours and stay up into the wee hours of the morning talking and laughing as info-dominant people do. And so those two things already make you perfect match. Your perfect match has to be the same quadra as you, and they have to be the same info or energy dominant as you. Then we were also perfect match in the socials. She's what's called a social four, I'm a social one. I'm a flex, responsible, generalist kind of person. And she's a friends specialist. And so these are like opposites attract kind of thing. Now you'll see that the opposites attract in human design is seen as pulling you away from yourself. That is in human design, it's like, you don't wanna necessarily be with your opposites because your opposite pulls you away from who you really are and conditions you to not be yourself. But in objective personality, it's not like this because the opposite is still you. In fact, it's, there are people that are not you, but the people that are not you are from a different quadra. The people that are not you don't have this relationship to you of basically being your shadow. So I guess what it's saying is, in objective personality, your shadow is still you. It's not like the not self in human design where that openness is not you where that openness is other people. It's more that in objective personality, what we realize is that you are a whole complete person, but that your personality type is very one-sided and ignores half of you. And so when you're with your perfect match, they are the half of you you've ignored. So in other words, I am half of one personality and Jenny is the other half of that same personality. And within me is someone just like her and within her is someone just like me. And that is the shadow slash anima animus in Jungian terms. I know it's a little bit complex, but bear with me here. And so the idea is that your perfect match actually prioritizes meeting the needs that you don't prioritize. See, everyone has the same basic human needs. We all have the same human needs. Personality type is a set of preferences and priorities for meeting some of those needs and not others. So as an example, I prioritize meeting the needs of variety, novelty, variety, change, new, you know, and I prioritize meeting the needs of significance, doing important work, doing work that I consider highly valuable, doing work that could be historically significant for the world, and doing work that gives me a strong sense of purpose in the world, a sense of importance, a sense of being special and having a special purpose in life. Those are the needs that I prioritize. Well, everyone has those needs. Everyone has those needs. I'm really good at making sure those needs are met. What needs do I not prioritize? The need for connection and love. You know, I don't prioritize that. I'm, I'm learning, right? My growth, my growth is to begin to prioritize that more. 
But most of my life I've said, oh, connection comes and goes. As long as I have my sense of purpose, that's okay. As long as I have my mission in life, that's okay. I'm not here to have connection and love with people. I'm here to make a difference in the world. And as long as I make a difference, that's enough for me. Well, it's not enough. It's not. We all need love. We all need connection. I didn't prioritize that. Obviously, I didn't, you know. I mean, if I would have prioritized connection and love, I would have really gone out of my way to ensure that the connection and love could have stuck around. But even, even that's not entirely true because the other thing I don't prioritize is certainty, safety, security, stability, risk averse, making sure something bad doesn't happen. No, I had way too much naive, optimistic, blind trust that the universe would provide and it took away my perfect match because I didn't have that stability, that safety. You know, I want to get married and settle down. I want to have kids. I want to have safety and security and stability. I want these things. Did I prioritize them? No. So you can see that everybody has all of the human needs. We just don't prioritize our shadow needs, our demon needs, so to speak. I prioritize meeting the needs of significance and meeting the needs of variety. Well, Jenny, being my exact opposite, she prioritizes connection and love, and she prioritizes safety and security and certainty, right? If you study the objective personality system, she's lead blast, uh, T-E-S-I, which is a technical way of saying she's prioritizing the needs of love and connection through her extroverted decider function and the needs of certainty, stability, security um, through her introverted observer function. Okay, hope everyone's still with me. I know it's quite a lot. I'm here at Santa Fe River, by the way, which has been flowing. It's been really nice to see. Really nice to see the river flow. I'm gonna try to get across the river here and then I'll continue on. And thanks for watching if you are watching. I know that this is, I've really been thinking about this for weeks of how to approach this. It's not an easy subject at all for many reasons. Okay, ah, okay, got a little wet, but I'm doing okay. So, um, okay, so where are we thus far? Everyone has all the needs. They are human needs, they are basic human needs. These come from Tony Robbins, by the way who kind of adapted them from Abraham Maslow. So we all have these basic human needs. There's actually six. The human needs are certainty, which is like safety, security, guarantees, you know, even though life has no guarantees, still doing what we can to have guarantees. Um, things like getting married, having kids, settling down, quote unquote. Those are some of the ways that we can try to have guarantees in life. Uncertainty or variety, that's also a need, right? A need to have change, to have excitement, to have a rich, full life, full of variety and change. Um, significance, that's the need to do something important and to feel special and to feel important. Um, connection, love, connection slash love. This is the need to have loving connections in your life. And then there's two others, which are growth, always be learning, always be growing, and contribution, to make a contribution to the world. And there are different ways you can do that, of course. So these are the six human needs. Four of them are in the personality preferences. As mentioned, I prefer variety and importance. Ginny prefers certainty and connection. So of course, these are conflicting, right? Certainty is the opposite of variety and connection is the opposite of significance or importance. And yet everyone needs all four. That's the trick. So see, this is where the growth mindset comes in, the willingness to learn and the willingness to grow, and then also having a shared sense of contribution of doing something together. Now, Jenny and I did have a shared contribution. We were working on the High Desert Human Design Conference together. She was essentially a co-founder the first year and a major player, co-founder, co-organizer the second year. So we had a shared sense of contribution. What I think we lacked was the growth mindset. 
And I, I still to this day feel really bad about that and have a lot of regret because I don't think I was as willing to learn as I should have been. And I don't think she was either. I don't think she was patient enough. Growth mindset has a lot of patience. We were growth mindset in certain ways. Growth mindset looks at challenges as opportunities for growth. And we did, we both did. But unfortunately, um, I don't think she had the patience to stick around and see what growth could come from those challenges. And I, I am very sad that neither of us had enough growth mindset. And then also that our shared sense of purpose through contribution um, wasn't strong enough to keep us sort of at least together as friends, if not actual partners. Uh, and, you know, that is very sad. It's very, very sad to me because it's very rare that you get to meet your perfect match out of 2048 possible types. I mean... I don't even know anyone else of her type in the world. I mean, I, I know a couple online only because we're in personality groups. Um, so I see them, you know, online. But, I mean, it's a very rare type match. It's very rare to be with your match type, and then also her type is very rare. Seemingly either rare or just very private, which could also be the case. So hard to find. Okay, so let's just talk about some of the dichotomies, and then we'll go into the difficulties, the challenges. Okay, so first dichotomy. She is a decider, I'm an observer. The technical name is single decider versus single observer. I'm actually gonna go this way, there's some noise over there. So I'm an observer, I can really help deciders when they get stuck in life. And deciders can really help me when I get stuck in life. And I've talked about this in other videos, so I won't go into it beyond just a simple overview, but essentially, when I get stuck in life, Jenny can see my side of it, my need for variety, but she actually prefers certainty, so she can help me see the value of certainty. She can see the value in both, unlike an observer who can only see the value in one, sort of. And this is very technical, I'm just giving a very brief overview. But basically, she's able like, not everyone can reach me. Hey, Jonah, you need more safety and security in your life. You need more stability in your life. She could reach me in that way. Also, because she's an extroverted decider, she could reach me and help me see the value of collaboration and pull me into teamwork and say, Jonah, you need a team. You can't do this on your own. You need connection and love. You can't just be this individualist, lone wolf, tough guy who goes out there and says, I don't need anyone and I'll do it all myself. And I'll tell you, the last couple of years, I've been doing that and it's not easy. It sucks, it really sucks. There's many, many long 12, 14 hour days where I wish I had someone to share with and I don't and I am alone kind of just working on it alone because I didn't prioritize love and connection as much as I should have. But she's the kind of person who can help me prioritize that. This is part of what makes us the best match. And I'm just saying this because I don't want people to just hear like best match as some like blanket statement, dreamy thing. It's like, no, best match for very real reasons. These are the reasons. Because she can actually help me see the value of connection and love and because she can help me see the value of certainty, stability, security, guarantees, promises, commitment, marriage, even kids. Although I've wanted those things, I haven't prioritized them, as I've mentioned. Okay, but then what do I give her? Well, I'm an observer, and like all observers, observers can help deciders when they get stuck on their points of view. So, because she's an expert at decider, she can get really stuck on other people's points of view and fear of being judged. And I can help her overcome that fear of being judged and could basically help her have more of a public voice, a public presence, overcome shyness, be more of a public persona, like grow into her sense of self in a public sphere. That's something I do naturally. That's something I could actually help her grow into. But I could also meet her need of variety and excitement and a rich, full life. Because as you'll remember, we all have all the needs. And what needs is she prioritizing? Sameness 
same old story, you know, safety, security. Um, she's prioritizing basically stability, security, not taking risks. And so I bring a lot of excitement into her life and have the ability to kind of bring her that side of it as well, to bring her the need of variety. So I'm basically bringing her two needs, significance and variety. And significance is basically doing something very important in her life. You know, if she's with another DE person, they're not gonna bring her that. She's not going to be doing something, she's not gonna be having those needs met. In the same way that if I'm with another DI person, I'm not gonna be having my needs met for connection and love. Like, unless we're both, we both done a lot of personal growth and really come to the other side. But it's almost like no matter how much personal growth you've done, unless you're with your perfect match, you pretty much need to have other people in your life to fill that in. So I'm not saying people are only supposed to be with their perfect match. Obviously it would be an amazing world if we could all be with our perfect match, if we could all have as good of relationships as Dave and Shan, but that's too idealistic. What it is is if you're not with your perfect match, you better have a close friend or a family member or a business partner or someone else in your life keeping you honest because your partner is gonna be dropping the ball in particular areas. When you're not with your perfect match, they drop the ball in basically enabling each other. It's an enabling relationship where they enable each other to not, um, to not grow, basically. And when you're with your perfect match, that's impossible. It is absolutely impossible because each person is so hardwired to prefer the opposite in each dichotomy, right? And, you know, again, just to kind of reiterate, it's not like human design where the opposite dichotomy is not you and it's pulling away from you. The opposite dichotomy is you. It's your shadow. It's the part of you you've ignored. So when you're with your perfect match, they actually really pull you into your shadow. Yeah, it's challenging. Yes, it's easy to demonize them. There can be all these problems there, but ultimately they are there for your growth and they're really on your team and they're really helping you. So, okay, so the first three we looked at. What are some of the other dichotomies? Um, the next dichotomy you could look at is sensing versus intuition. Jenny is sensing, I'm intuitive. So for that dichotomy, I'm really good at summarizing, I'm really good at overviews, I'm good at categorizing, I'm really good at understanding. That's my great gift. I'm good at helping others understand. So I could bring her a lot of that gift of helping her understand things. But sensors are really good at clarity. They're really good at coming to clear agreements and proof in reality. Like marriage is a very sensing thing. Like, look, we're in love. Here's the proof, right? Here's the marriage document. Certification, you know? Um, clarity of like what you're getting yourself into, what the expectations are. Clarity in terms of like, let's get some clarity around what our goals are in life. Let's get some clarity around what our desires are. Let's get some clarity around what we want. Let's get clarity in all these different areas of life. For me, I have a very hard time with that. I'm clarity challenged. And so as a clarity person, she brought me so much practice and teaching me how to be more clear. And I brought her so much understanding and teaching her how to explain things and how to understand things in so many different ways. So it's this beautiful, beautiful, kind of simpatico connection that you have between sensing and intuition. And it's not always very easy. The sensing intuitive divide can be very hard, but when you have the commonality of both being info dominant and both being in the same quadra, you're able to reach each other. And also the fact observers can reach deciders more easily and vice versa. So there's all these things to like help bridge the worlds. Like we're from different worlds, but we have these deep commonalities that can be bridged. The next is thinking feeling. She's a thinker, I'm a feeler. And on the thinking feeling dichotomy, she is very much about getting things done and, and getting them working and not prioritizing being on the same page or being in sync with people. I mean, hey, you can tell it's been over 600 days I've been waiting to synchronize with her and she refuses to sync with me. That's going extremely into the thinking zone. When thinkers grow towards feeling, they become more willing to get on the same page and synchronize with other people through communication, connection, things like that. And instead though, when they're really one-sided, 
then they sort of foreclose on their opposite and they're in a fixed mindset and refuse to grow, what ends up happening is they end up saying, that's not important. So she's basically saying, Jonah, it's not important for you and I to get on the same page. Yes, I told you we'd talk in a couple days and then I didn't talk to you for six months and then we talked for, you know, 80 minutes and then I said we'd talk again soon and then I sent you an email saying never talk to me again. But that's not important. We don't need to talk anymore. Well, that's a very thinking approach. And the thing is, feeling realizes how important it is to actually connect and get on the same page with somebody and not just blow them off like that and not just write them off like that, not just reject them. I mean, rejecting, sure, but in that way, right? Now, I could give her a lot of development and growth and understanding of feeling issues, how to be on the same page, how to be responsible for the vibe, how to not run away from a bad vibe. It's almost like thinkers are the most likely to leave a bad vibe because they feel powerless to change it. So it's almost like she's being like, Jonah, you're a bad vibe, so I can't talk to you. And it's like, yeah, but if you had more courage in your feeling, maybe that's not the right word, I don't mean to be hurtful here, but more um, empowerment in your feeling function, then you, you would be able to know that you have the power to change the vibe and to be responsible for the vibe. And you don't have to shirk responsibility for the vibe, so to speak, or feel powerless when it comes to the vibe. So this is just saying that, you know, I'm being on the feeling side, she's on the thinking side. I bring her empowerment when it comes to the vibe. Now on the thinking side, what does she bring me? She brings me empowerment to be more logical and more rational and reasonable. In fact, a lot of what she was saying over the years was like, Jonah, be rational. Jonah, be logical, right? And I wasn't, and it was really helpful for me. And maybe in my fixed mindset, I didn't show enough gratitude for that, and, I'm, and for that I'm sorry, but it actually was really helpful. And she could help me bridge the gap over to my thinking, learning how to be more efficient, effective, how to get things done, how to be responsible for logic and reasons, and making sure things work, and just being efficient in life. Um, you know, we each grow and learn from the other. And she can learn that there's things more important than work. And I can learn that there's things more important than having to be on the same page. You know, I can learn patience. I think I've been working on it, you know. Almost 700 days of patience now, right? But that's what the feeling type has to learn from the thinking type is the patience that you can't just be urgent to get back in sync with someone. Things take time and, you know... It's important to wait and to be patient for we're getting in sync. And the thinking type learns there are also other things that are important besides just working and moving on with your life and kind of pretending that it's not important. Like th thinking types often have their values kind of out of whack because they're not really analyzing their values all the time. They're not really, it's almost like values don't compute. Like, they just kind of, like, change their allegiance of what's important. And they're like, that's not important anymore. Oh, we broke up. It's not important that I talk to you anymore. Like, that's not really the most growth mindset attitude for a thinking type. In their growth mindset, they're more willing to continue talking because they still consider the other person important and valuable. They don't just, like, throw them away like a used tissue. Like, this is not valuable anymore. This is trash. This is garbage. And that's kind of how I felt. You know, I felt that that's the way she's treated me. Okay, so thinking, feeling, that's another dichotomy we each bring to each other. So you can see that the perfect match is your opposite in these key dichotomies. And, and yet, it's not pulling you away from yourself. It's helping you grow and bridging those gaps. Okay, she's a sleep person. Sleep people are very good at letting go of the past, letting things become the past. Basically, sleep is just about processing things, but not even processing externally, allowing them to kind of, like just allowing yourself to rest, like not keeping things alive, not keeping hopes alive and dreams alive, allowing things to fail and just be what they are. And that's something I've had to learn. It's been very, very hard for me to learn. I still, part of me has some little inkling of hope, will be able to talk again someday. I've kept some little modicum of hope alive, but you know, it's, it's hard because it takes energy. And sleep is really good at conserving energy 
and at basically allowing things to just be what they are and sort of accept them and surrender to them. So, you know, it's, it's actually very important for me to learn that. I actually think Ra had this challenge too. He was not a sleep person. So a lot of what he talked about with surrendering to life was like really good advice for himself too. Um, basically, sleep is, you know, it's not easy at all uh, for me. And it's something she does naturally. So she was able to really help me grow and learn how to let go of things. But what do I help her with? Play. Play is opening up, being vulnerable, letting it all out, speaking, public speaking, thinking aloud, just letting yourself not know what you're going to say and just saying whatever comes out and trusting in life. It's one of the values that I gave her. She's a blast person. I'm a consumed person. I kind of covered that a little bit already. Blast is all about certainty and connection. Consume is all about variety and significance. So I know how to be, how to do things that are significant and important and valuable and how to be in touch with making a difference in the world. And I also know how to be open to a variety of pathways to get there. She knows about how important it is to have certainty of connection, things like being sure and certain in your connection and to, to eliminate the chaos that can come sometimes from uncertainty. And so, so again, you know, I'm a consumed person. She's a blast person. We brought a lot to each other. I'm masculine sensing. She's feminine sensing. This is one of the most archetypally drawn to each other ways of being there is. That the masculine sensing is just naturally attracted to the feminine sensing. There was no shortage of, of attraction there. I'm feminine extroverted decider. She's masculine extroverted decider. I have a very gentle, soft, careful way of explaining things. She's more blunt and direct we each bring to each other a lot of value there. I'm learning how to be more direct. She can learn how to be more eloquent and so on. And then I'm an extrovert, she's an introvert. She gets to a state of inertia where she needs to be pushed to move. I get to a state of burnout and exhaustion where I need to slow down and relax. She gave me that respite, that place where I could really feel safe and relaxed and hide away from the extroverted world, I gave her that little push to, to do and to create and to really be, be and do all she can be, right? Um, so, okay, so that's enough of that. I know it's quite a long preamble, but uh, oh yeah, I'm a flex person. I help her, you know, elevate and push herself. She's a friend's person. She helps me develop empathy. I'm a generalist. I take responsibility for things. She's a specialist. She helps me specialize. I help her take more responsibility for her life. Like, literally in every one of the 13 coins, we support each other. And we're both info doms, so we both learn a lot of info together. So, I mean, this is what I mean by the perfect match. The perfect match is not some, like, crazy thing that I made up. The perfect match is literally the ideal person you are supposed to be with that you could be with the rest of your life and you could continue growing and changing and learning throughout your entire life with that person. So that's why it is sad that we messed it up. And that's why, ultimately, I wanted to frame this whole thing um, not as Jonah's, you know, sad sack hour of boo-hoo, you know, I had my perfect match and it didn't work. Um, I really wanted to frame it more as, you know, what did I learn? You know, what are some lessons here? What are some things that you can do to not uh, make the same mistakes I made, right? And so the first is growth mindset. I did not have a growth mindset. The growth mindset is the willingness to learn. I did things that hurt Jenny, and I was not willing to learn. And I just dis dismissed and diminished and rationalized and made excuses. Stop doing that, you know? You can be with your perfect match and do something that hurts their feelings and then be like, oh, why did it hurt your feelings? That's dumb. You know, not obviously like that, but I mean, just don't do that. Like, growth mindset is like be genuinely eager to learn how they see the world. Be genuinely eager to learn and grow and change and develop as a person. And I just wasn't enough. I wasn't. Also, recognize your perfect match. I didn't know. There was such a question. Are we supposed to be together? Are we a good match? I mean, human design was saying that we're not a great match. We're six and three and we don't have a defined solar plexus and this and that. And, 
you know, and, and our nodes don't match up and all this stuff. That's all crap. Like literally we were the perfect match and we got confused because we didn't know that. So learn to recognize your perfect match. Like it doesn't matter if you have a split in your partnership chart in human design. It doesn't matter any of this stuff. Like I haven't looked at Dave and Shan's body graphs, but I'm sure they have a lot of quote unquote problems of partnership. That's not a problem. Like literally if you're with your perfect match, it doesn't matter what, how many centers you have to find. It doesn't matter any of that stuff. They're your perfect match. Like they are the best person for you to be with, to grow and change and learn in this life. And what you end up with is just what you end up with. And honestly, we didn't have a lot of problems there. Um, but I guess don't let your mind interfere with things is one lesson. Getting in the way like, oh, we only have six centers to find together. Maybe we're not right together. Learn to recognize your perfect match. Learn, like, learn the objective personality system. Learn to recognize who your perfect match is so you don't just overlook them and ignore them. And have a growth mindset. Have contribution together. That's another human need. Do something together that you both really care about. I mean, we had this with High Desert Human Design and with some of our projects, but obviously it wasn't enough. And that's why I say it's so tragic that it didn't work out because we were doing all this stuff together. And I'll, I'll say it's actually really hard doing it without her. It is so hard each year. I just want to like cry most nights because I want to share with her like what the thing we created is doing. And I can't because I'm blocked and shut out in every way. And I, I hate it, you know. Uh, I totally hate it, and it's just really, really hard. But having that shared sense of contribution together, something that you're actually doing together to contribute to the world, so important. And then um, be careful of the friends in your life. You know, this has happened, especially because she's a fourth line. She has this, had or has this really bitter projector friend who's been single for like seven years who just is really spiteful and hateful and would literally tell me like, it's so good you guys broke up. You guys were a terrible match. This person has no idea. We were literally the best match, better than any match that she's ever had in her life, I'm sure. And yet she had the audacity, the audacity to tell us we were a bad match. And it's like, and I believed her. And like, so, so did Jenny, you know? Jenny really took it seriously what she said. So be careful having poisonous, toxic friends that lead you astray. Like. This is another reason why whenever I do partnership readings, I never, ever, ever in a million years suggest people break up. Like if somebody came to me and they were in an abusive relationship or something, sure. But I've never like seen an abusive relationship like that. And Jenny and I certainly weren't in one. And, you know, unless something like that is happening, um, then, you know, you should never tell someone to break up. But I mean, that's not even what this friend was saying. She wasn't like, you guys are abusive to each other. She's just like, oh, you're not a very good match. You're just like very different people. You're like not really like on the same wavelength, you know, you shouldn't be together. And it's like, she had no idea. We were literally the best match. We are literally the best match still. We're just not together anymore. So, I mean, that's part of it is be very careful about friends. Also, this stranger dude who she met as a stranger, I mean, this may be fourth line, like stranger danger. She met this guy at a concert. He promised that he would never interfere with us. They started a romantic involvement, which because I didn't value certainty and connection enough, I was like more like new variety significance. Like, yeah, do your own thing. Like do it, do what you feel is right. Like I'll still be here. I still love you. I'm still open to you. And then of course, now I can't ever talk to her again, partly because he's this cross of rulership that like, even if he hasn't literally told her never to talk to me again, it's just kind of implied and assumed, you know? So, I mean, be careful in that regard, I guess. So, okay, let's just do a little recap. So, growth mindset, you have to be willing to learn. Contribution, you have to be of service together. Have something you're doing of service that will help keep you together. Learn to recognize your best match. Learn to see who they really are. Um, don't be poisoned by toxic friends who encourage you to break up. That's a big one. Be careful of outsiders. Outsiders can pretend to be rooting for the two of you. I mean, this guy literally said that he was rooting for us and that he would never do anything to interfere with us and that he thought that we were such a great couple and he was so happy for us and he would never interfere and, you know, and then totally interfered. So, you know, be more careful, I guess you could say. Don't, don't be so naive and optimistic and trusting. Um, but yeah, I think the most important things are be willing to learn, be willing to see the other's point of view, learn to recognize them because again, it's not necessarily easy to recognize them. You can really overlook your best match. And then I guess here's one of the other challenges is 
it's easy to demonize your best match, like to legitimately demonize them. It is easy to see them as a bad person. Why? Because they embody all of your shadow characteristics. So it requires this huge amount of self-love to actually see them as you, right? Because they're so opposite of you, but then in a deep way, they're actually the same as you because they're the same quadra and they have kind of the same goal and you have the same human needs. I mean, they're like the other part of you. They're the part of you that you've rejected. So true self-love doesn't just mean loving your saviors. It means loving your demons too. True self-love isn't just loving two of the four needs, you know. It's loving all of them, right? My self-love isn't like, oh, I love variety and significance. It's like, no, I have to also love the fact that I need love and connection. I have to also love the fact that I need stability and security. And for Jenny, she can't just love her stability and security and connection. She needs to also love the part of her that craves doing something significant and important in the world and the part of her that craves variety and change and excitement and richness. And so, yeah, I mean, this is really just to say, like, when you really are with your perfect match, they are challenging you in every way possible to love yourself in ways that you have never been challenged before. When you're with somebody who's less than your perfect match, at least one or two or three or probably more like six or eight of the ways, they're not challenging you, they're enabling you. And I'm not saying that's a bad thing. Most of us aren't lucky enough to get to be in a relationship with our perfect match. But if you're not with your perfect match, you need someone else in your life who will hold you accountable in that way. You need someone else in your life who will kind of hold your feet to the fire. Because if you're a certainty connection person and you marry another certainty connection person, the two of you have more than enough certainty and connection and you're very comfortable, but neither of you are challenging each other for variety and significance. So you have this comfortable, cozy life, but you're not actually doing what you came here to do, and you have needs that aren't being met. If you're a variety significance person like me, and then you're in a relationship with another variety significance person, you're having all these adventures and all this fun, and you're going all these places, and you're doing all this important stuff, but you're not actually getting to enjoy the real support of a true loving connection and the safety and security and stability of the certainty need. And we all have all the needs. You know, I need certainty. I need connection and love. Do I prioritize them? No. No, I don't. I haven't. And that's why if I'm not with a partner who prioritizes those things, or if I don't have a close friend or business partner or family member in my life who really pushes me to prioritize those things, I won't do it. I just won't. No matter how much growth mindset, it's like the real growth mindset is being with somebody that pushes you in that way. That's the proof of the growth, the growth mindset. So I'll wrap it up now. Thanks for watching. I know this has gotten quite long, but this is just to say, um, yeah, cautions of your perfect match, things to be careful of. Don't mess it up, you know, don't mess it up. Because if you do, you might never forgive yourself. That's my challenge now, is really learning to forgive myself and, uh, you know, learning to own and take responsibility for the things that I did that destroyed what was the happiest relationship of my life and the potential to be the happiest relationship I'd ever have. And not only that, but the one most supportive of me fulfilling my life purpose. And with the caveat that part of my growth mindset is being open to being wrong about that because I don't know what's around the corner. I might meet someone who's, you know, the exact opposite of that, I guess the exact same as me, and we might have an incredibly fulfilling relationship. So I'm leaving the space open as part of the growth mindset that, you know, it's the fixed mindset says that's just the way it is and there's no chance for anything else. The growth mindset says, no, I could be wrong. I'm still learning. The story is not over. I am still learning and I may have the best relationship of my life in my 40s, right? But I also don't want to have this toxic positivity, wishful thinking thing. And I also want to accept that may have been my only real chance at having my best match relationship. And that's okay too. I messed it up and people make mistakes and I have to learn forgiveness and self-love for having made those mistakes 
with the knowledge that that might have been my only chance in this life to be with my best match. It's just the way it is. Thanks for watching.